on his feet. I pray again that Swami gives us all the understanding it is Swami who speaks and it is Swami who listens to each one of us. Sarah everyone, thank you for that wonderful game. Uh, initially I was told that there's a session after lunch and keeping the people awake is my work. <laughs> so I think that is taken care of. We've all been woken up and all cheered up. I'll start with a little story that one of my seniors once shared. Swami was taking some of these students to Kodekanal. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that uh, summer retreat that Swami would do with students which would range from a couple of weeks to even a month sometimes. And they would have a lot of fun with Swami. And one thing with Swami when you travel, much like what you all are doing to me, Swami would ensure that there is a fair bit of sightseeing. Right? Swami would, uh, when Swami would go for darshan, sometimes Swami would call the boys and say, okay, all of you go for horse riding, go for boating. Because that's the only time Swami can spend with the devotees. The rest of the day Swami was with the students. <laughs> So one time Swami said, you know, you all should go to this place called the, I think, Silver Cascade or something like that. It's a, it's a very famous tourist attraction in Kodekanam. So Swami said, I'll put you all in a bus, you can go see the place and come. And invariably when Swami says that, the students will say, Swami, you should come along, you should come with us. So Swami consented and Swami said, okay, I'll come with you. So Swami's car was going and the boys were following in a bus. In a secluded spot, Swami stopped the car and got into the bus. You could just imagine that scene. Swami was sitting on one of the seats and there were students all around Swami. Literally two boys on Swami, putting their head on Swami's lap. One seeing from the cell, one seeing from the cell. Everybody and Swami is talking something, a beautiful scene of everyone around Swami, literally crowding around Swami. And what was Swami doing? He was playing the role of a tour guide. Right? Because he's been to Kodekanal many times, when many of these students were coming for the first time. So Swami was saying, you know, it's a very beautiful place, there is this uh, point where you can see the rest of the valley, and all of that Swami is saying. And at one point when the bus was turning, you could see that waterfall from that part of the road, what's called the Silver Cascade. And all of a sudden Swami said, hey, look there, that's the waterfall. And a sudden change in the whole setup in the bus. Everyone is now peering out of the window. Right? Swami is sitting there and all the students, because I mean, not, it's not their mistake, Swami asked them to see. Right? In one second, everyone is looking out of the window and Swami is sitting there. And very softly, Swami said, Ah, keep looking, keep looking. All beauty is outside. After all, only God is inside. Is it? All beauty is outside. After all, only God is inside. And it suddenly struck them, you know, however much they were not to be blamed, the message that Swami was trying to give was loud and clear. So instantly the curtains were drawn <laughs> in the bus and everybody turned to Swami. But for some reason, it looked like Swami was more upset than they thought the, this whole thing would make Swami, you know. Swami became very aloof. Swami stopped talking and Swami was quiet. And till they went to this particular spot, Swami was quiet. Then Swami showed them around. And they're very cold. He gets into the car and drives back to Sai Shruti. That evening, when all the students are sitting around, Swami is still quiet. Swami is not talking. So all of the students and some teachers and uh, VIPs were there invited. They were all sitting around Swami and Swami is sitting like that, not talking anything. So one of the elders thought, let's begin the conversation. So he said, 
Swami. It is our good fortune that we are with Swami. We are able to spend this time with Swami. Swami was quiet. And then somebody added, Swami, we don't know what good we have done to deserve this opportunity of being with Swami. <coughs> Swami was still quiet. And then somebody else added, said, no Swami, we have not done any good to deserve this. We might have done in the past. So past birth, we must have done a lot of good. Swami said, mm. And then someone else added to that, not just us Swami, our parents and grandparents and ancestors, the good that all of them have done is what has given us the merit of being with you. And he said, mm. So they understood, you have to keep quiet now. <laughs> and then Swami said, have you heard of these great sages and saints who are supposed to be meditating in the Himalayas? Right? They've been doing meditation and tapas for so many years. Have you heard about them? Swami said. And then he continued very profoundly. Swami said, when I go to give them darshan, right? they might be worshipping any form. They are not necessarily doing tapas to have Swami's darshan. Right? They might be worshipping Lord Shiva or Devi or whatever is the form they are drawn to. But Swami said, when I go to give them darshan, Swami said, the darshan lasts a few seconds. And here you are spending so much time with Swami. Then he went on to say that how easy it is for all of you. You jump into a bus, you come and see me, you get into a flight, you come and have Swami's darshan. And then Swami said, you know that you don't deserve it. Right? You know that you have not done any good to deserve this, but you don't want to let go of the credit. So you say, maybe in some past birth I must have done, or my father must have done, my grandparents must have done. Right? You, the humility is not complete. You don't want to let go of that credit. And then Swami said, remember this, not one of you in front of me deserves one millionth of the time that you're spending in front of me. He said, yes. Have you done good? You have done good. Your goodness has ensured that you get drawn to my godliness. But not one of you is worth one millionth the time that you're spending in front of me. So he didn't stop there. What he said next was more important. Because he said, but the saddest part is not that. The saddest part is not one of you is making use of one millionth of the time that you're spending in front of me. The first time I heard this, a chill ran down my spine. Because I heard it when Swami was physically there. So it started filling me with the idea that every time I'm sitting in front of Swami, that much I'm letting go. Right? If I'm spending, if I'm making use of only one millionth of the time I'm spending in front of Swami, how much we are letting go? It's like you're trying to hold fine sand in your arms and it's just, the harder you hold, the more it falls away. Right? What is a good good sum of money in Singapore, because I don't know, 100, 100 million or a million, million dollars? Is that a lot of money? <clears throat> because sorry, I, you know, our references are so bad. I remember this used to happen with Swami. A classmate of mine, after we had finished graduation, he got a job in a bank and he came back to have Swami's darshan and take Swami's blessings. And it would happen that uh, there, would, there would be a lot of parity in salary, right? You come from a Sadhisa University versus some of the premier institutes, Indian Institute of Management or something like that. So some of our boys would feel bad that you know we don't get the salary as much as the boys coming from these institutes, even though the, the output of the work is similar, as competent as anybody else. 
So this fellow also must have been cribbing. He said, oh, don't get enough salary. So that day he came and sat for bhajans. And uh, Swami calls him and Swami asks, hey, you know, Swami would have interesting names for each one. Some would say Darjeeling boy, a Shimla boy, something like that. Or sometimes even more interesting names. So I used to call one of my lecturers three mangoes. Right? And some used to repeatedly say that three mangoes, three mangoes. He never got it why Swami is calling him that. And one day Swami asked him, you know why I call you three mangoes? And he said, no Swami. So this lecturer is a very short gentleman, right? So Swami told him, if you put three mangoes one top of the other, that is how tall you are. <laughs> you know, so Swami would have interesting names like this and those names would you know, uh, endure. People would remember that even after much later. So I think Swami called him by some name like that. And it's, it's always a joy, which means Swami has recognized you. Right? And hundreds of students, Swami has recognized you. It might be even a, a name that you wouldn't be otherwise proud of. So Swami called this boy, hey, Shivla boy, or something like that, I don't remember now. And Swami asked him, where are you? Have you got a job? And then Swami asked him, how much salary are you getting? So I think at that time, this was like uh, 2004 or 5. So he said, Swami, they're giving me just 18,000. And Swami was like, oh, 18,000? Why are they giving you so much money? <laughs> because the reference is so off, right? In Parthi, 18,000 is a lot of money. This boy was complaining till then to all of us how he is getting paid so less. And Swami said, 18,000 rupees. Are you doing enough work for that? <laughs> this boy says, no Swami, they cut taxes and all that. And still 18,000 is a lot of money. <laughs> right? So I, that's why I'm asking, uh, let's say a million dollars. So let's say someone comes and gives you a million dollars. What will be your emotion? Can some of you say what will be your emotion if someone gives you a million dollars? Or say a hundred million dollars? Excited, thrilled. Excited, thrilled. Anything else? Shock. 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 Why me? Holiday. <laughs> right. Holiday, yeah? How to spend that money? Grateful. Anything else? Ecstatic. Ecstatic. How to go about it? How to go about it? So, what is that emotion like? The excitement. The excitement you're gone. So, what I do this, what I do that, what I do. Right. I have hundred and one plans. So will it not also give this feeling, as you said, what to do with it? In the sense like, uh, maybe a, a little more prudent in our thinking and say that, I don't want to just use it up, right? How do I use it in a manner that it really lasts? You don't want to be rich for a day, right? I mean, that's, that's not maturity. If somebody gives you a lot of money, you want to say that, you know, how, how do I use it in a manner that I can actually be, sustain, sustain this and you know, be a little wealthy for a longer time. So if you get a lot of money like that, I would also throw in the emotion of, it will make me a little restless. What am I going to do with this? I came across this, what is a, a very interesting study that was done, I think in Stanford. A lot of these people who get a, who have won bounties in jackpots, in lotteries. So they wanted to follow the life of these people and see how did they go about using the money. Right? So when they traced a lot of them, right from, you know, they have these huge lotteries in UK. Lot of, lot of money and Super Bowl and all these stuff. The study threw up something very stunning. It said 70% of these people who had won money like this squandered it off in the first one year. 
and they all land up in the same financial situation they were before they won the money. And what a scary thought. Right? Isn't it a scary thought? So oftentimes, with the acknowledgement of what a blessing it is to know Swami, should come this fear-filled restlessness. Am I making the best use of this? It's one thing to be happy, it's one thing to be grateful, it's one thing to be excited about it. But am I making the best use of this? Or is it like, as I said, the sand that is slipping away from my palm? Should I not use it in such a way that I never return back to the situation I came when I, when I won this grace? Because everything is about sustainability, right? If someone tells you you have you have a million dollars in your bank account, but you can't use it, what's the point? So will I still feel rich? Will I be happy feeling rich about it? So this question of what am I supposed to really do? Well, we may discuss an answer for that. I will also throw it up to all of you. But I think more than anything, what is important is that restlessness. Constantly ask every time you sit in front of Swami, every time you pray, every time you do bhajans, Swami, am I making use of you? Right? I know it sounds a little odd to say that. But am I making use of you? Am I, am I doing justice to your presence in my life? So one of the teachers once asked this question to Swami. When Swami said, anybody has any questions? And uh, it came up to this lecturer and Swami, he said, Swami, I have a question I want to ask you. And Swami said, yes, tell me. So he said, Swami, I want to know from the avatar. I want to know from the avatar what is the best way to use the avatar. What is the best way to make use of this presence in our life? So I will come to that answer eventually, but I would like to just ask some of you, what do you think is the best use of Swami's presence in our life? There are no, there are no right or wrong answers. There are only answers that uh, we eventually grow out of, I think. Right? The answers which eventually mature and ripen. So what do you think is the purpose of Swami's presence in our life. Anyone? Yes. Right. So he guides us on this path of love, truth, and how do you move forward, be a good person, right? Anything else? Self transformation. Self transformation. So, should you say from bad to good? I, I used to say this in a lighter sense, I don't mean it. I used to say this. So, I, mean, I was always a good boy. And even before I came to you, I didn't have any bad habits. Only thing is, after I became your student, you took all the credit. <laughs> Just in lighter sense, because I know what what his presence means in my life. It it makes a sense. I mean, transformation is a big thing. If someone is really bad and they've you know, turned a new leaf, for most of us, the transformation is very subtle, and that is one of the things I'm driving at. So, anything else? What is? Or should I rephrase the question in this manner? Right now, Swami is here. Right? right now he is here and wherever you are, he is in your house, he is in my house, he is in Parthi, he is in Singapore, India, Malaysia, Australia, anywhere. Why did he have to come in a form? What is that that he could achieve only by coming in a name and form? Right? That would be his purpose, isn't it? Because if it could have been done otherwise, he would have had to come in a name and form. 
Why did the Supreme Lord, who is omnipresent, have to come in the form of Satya Sai Baba into our life? If we are able to find out what is it that he came for, that becomes his purpose in my life, isn't it? So can anyone think of what is that purpose for which he came? So, to sort of a, set an example, you could think of, yeah. Human cycle, whatever it right. But why would he have to come? So you and I are forced to come. We don't have a choice. Somebody says you all have done karma. You have to come and enjoy it and suffer it and whatever it is. And very clearly, even in, in the Gita, Krishna says, I am beyond karma. There is no necessity for me to come. But still he comes. Raising our dharma. And for our understanding, because he needs to talk to us in our language. When he is not there, omnipresence right. and all, we understand that. But the Gita Krishna says uh, it's for us to raise and uh, to upbring the past, you know, it's not for him to come, but for right. us. Uh, for right. Us. So that is understood. He has come to raise us. But why is it that he cannot do it without the form? When you see, you believe. So when, when you see, you see Okay. Right. So the, whenever there is a decline in the righteousness, in the, then it comes. So there was this student who asked this question to Swami very interestingly. He said, Swami, in the Gita you are told, Yada Yada Vidharma Sri that you come. You also tell us that the first yuga, Satya yuga was perfect, then Treta yuga came, it was a little better, then Dwapara came, it is not as good as Treta, and now you have Kali yuga. So the student asked Swami, in Treta yuga you came as Rama, things became worse and it became Dwapara. In Dwapara you came as Krishna, things became so bad it became Kali. So, what is this? You, you say that dharma is being established, but we see that dharma is actually declining. So, how do we make sense of that? This was a question he asked Swami. I will tell you what the answer Swami gave, but before that, any other thoughts? Right, okay. His love for his own children. It was one of the ways by which Swami can express his love. Absolutely, right. So that is also one of the very important things. In fact, uh, there is this very interesting story. Some of you might have heard it. We narrated it as part of that Satya Sai series also. When uh, the students were practicing for gymnastics during the sports day, right? And Swami was going for a drive. And Swami just came into that gymnasium where they were all practicing. So these were the the gymnasts of the hostel are the athletes, right? really well built, uh, very healthy, those kind of sculpted bodies. So Swami comes there and there was this ace gymnast of the hostel who was doing all these routines. And then Swami sat there for some time, saw whatever they were doing, Roman rings and uh, all that stuff. And then Swami started giving some tips of how to maintain your health. So Swami said, you know, you should do these kind of exercises, you should warm up your body before you start doing things like that. And then slowly Swami started talking about how to build muscles, what kind of workouts you have to do. So this boy who was standing in the corner as part of that group which was listening, I think a, a smirk must have escaped him. 
Right? He just couldn't control himself. And Swami saw it. And Swami looked at him in trouble. Why are you laughing? Why are you smiling? He said, no, Swami, nothing. Then Swami stood up and Swami said, I know. You are thinking, look at Swami's form. He is telling us how to build muscle. And here was this really well-built muscular athlete. And Swami said, I know. That is what you are thinking. He said, what does Swami know about bodybuilding that he is teaching us? And Swami said, you want to try out? Swami said, come. Who is coming? It was an invitation to arm wrestle with Swami. Right? Yeah. Forget about winning or losing. It's a time to, you have a chance to hold Swami's hand. So this boy came forward and said, yes, Swami, why not? So when he first held Swami's hand, he said, yes, Swami, he's so tender, looking so soft. Let me not hurt Swami. <laughs> so he held Swami's hand as gently as he could. And Swami held it. So the others were standing around and they were all probably envious of the chance that this boy was getting. And as they were seeing, the smile on this face of this boy slowly vanished. He started looking, looking a little tensed. And then they saw that he started sweating. And then when they looked at the hand, he was gripping Swami's hand hard and he was, the hand was you know, shaking. And everybody was then realized that he's actually trying to arm wrestle with Swami and he's not able to move Swami's arm one bit. And then they're seeing that his, all his veins are bulging and he's struggling with all his might and Swami is smiling and just holding him down. Like that. <laughs> not a, you know, not a, a shade of stress on Swami's face. And then Swami looked around at the other boys and Swami said, you want to join in? You want to help your friend? The next three or four boys pounced into the scene and all four of them trying to put down Swami's hand and Swami is holding them. Then in a you know single shot, Swami put all of them down. Right? Till then you are thinking, oh Swami is so soft, Swami we should not hurt. After this happened, all the other boys are like, yes Swami of course you can, you, know, you can put down the whole world. <laughs> What's so surprising in that? And then Swami said, do you know that I did not use any of my divine power at all? I did not use my divine power to put you all down. So they said, well, this is not fair, Swami. I mean, you're God and you just admit it. No? You used a little more than human powers. Swami said, no, I did not use any human powers. Then Swami said something very, very profound. Swami said, this is the power of purity. Then Swami said, from the time that this, this body has touched the ground, touched Mother Earth, not a single selfish thought has crossed this mind. Not once a selfish thought has crossed this mind and what you witnessed is the power of that purity. Right? So, and you said that he comes to give an example of what is what we are capable of achieving through this human body and human birth. He has come to show that, no doubt. So to that question of what is the best way to use the avatar? What do you think Swami's answer must have been? And don't think too beyond uh, simple things. Right now, what should I do to make use of Swami's presence in my life? Anyone? Think of me Surrender. Always. Think of me always. Be fully in that moment. Be in the present. Have faith without any expectations. Have faith without any expectations. Try and develop a level of purity. Walk with Swami. Sorry? Walk with Swami. Walk with Swami. Inspire. Sorry? Follow his teachings. Surrender. Surrender. So, yes. Uh, realize his divinity within you. Realize his divinity within you. Inquire what am I here for? Inquire what am I here for? Being a part of him. Being a part of him. Uh, put God first, others next, self at the last. Right. Put God first and then. Others all next and self at last. <coughs> right now, 
I mean, all of this is, uh, as I said, nothing is a wrong answer. Everything is a correct answer. Everything is part of that correct answer. But now, okay, you're not going anywhere. There are no troubles for you to surrender. You're not thinking of others right now. Each one of us, right? Don't think of your family. Don't think of anything else. In your life, Swami has come. He is there in your life. Right now, what is it that I should do, I can do, which will make full use of this moment in which Swami is there in my life? Believe. Believe, okay. Gratitude. Sorry? Gratitude. Gratitude, okay. Experience. Experience him. Loving the most. Ah, thank you. <laughs> So that's the answer. Swami just said this. Swami just said, what is the best use of the avatar in your life? I want to know from the avatar. Swami's answer was, love me. As simple as that, as complicated as that. And that's why I said, nothing what you said was wrong. Right? None of what we said was wrong because everything else becomes an expression of that love. When I say I want to love Swami, I, I often say, please don't tell me love Swami. Explain to me what that is. Don't tell me love all. Explain to me what, what that means. Because it's like a very mushy word you can throw at someone and say, that's what you have to do. Something more practical. Right? What should I do? Love Swami, but what is it? So all the answers that you gave were in different stages of our journey, we'll come up with this. So if I love Swami, what should I do? Yeah, I have to look at his teachings. If I love Swami, what should I do? Yeah, I should become selfless. I should do Swami's work. I should come and work in his organization. Like some of us, I would go and work in Swami's institutions. But what Swami said, you must love me, is much, much, much more profound than what we can imagine. And an entire lifetime can be spent just by asking Swami, what is it to love you? Swami says this very beautiful thing in uh, one of his discourses. He says, you come to me for all kinds of things. You come to me, you ask me for admission in some college, and I want a child. One of my classmates, Swami had called him for an interview, and along with him, Swami had called another couple, an elderly couple. And uh, if I'm not wrong, it was the same interview. He heard Swami speaking to this couple in fluent Malayalam. This boy didn't understand a word of it because he, he was a Telugu boy. But Swami was fluently talking to that couple in Malayalam. That couple was talking back to Swami in Malayalam. And like, very beautiful conversation happening. And he could make out that there was something serious exchange was happening between that couple and Swami. And then all of a sudden, Swami turned to this boy and Swami said, you know, Do you know what happened? Swami said, See, this couple, they came to me long back. They were a young couple then. They came to me and said, Swami, we want a child. We want to have a son. And apparently Swami told them, why do you want to have a son? <laughs> it's all right. Why don't you lead your life just the way you are? Swami usually doesn't say that. right? Swami never uh, says that to couples. So here was this couple who was saying that, Swami, we want a son. And Swami was saying that, no, no. We... They said, uh, Swami, but you know, we want a child. We would like to have a child. And Swami went to the extent of saying, why don't you take me as your son? Right? How sweet of Swami to say that. Swami said, why don't you take me? Why do you want another son? So then the couple said, Swami, you know that we both are doctors. And they used to run a fertility clinic. <laughs> right? They said, it's very odd if we do not have children of our own. So they said, Swami, we want to have a child. So I said, okay. So I blessed them. They got a child. Then Swami said, a few years later, they came back. And they said, Swami, we want admission in school. 
So he said, okay, I gave them the child in admission. A few years went by, they again came back to me and they said, Swami, we want a job for the son. I blessed him, he got a job. Then they came back and said, Swami, we want marriage for the son. So Swami blessed that also. And then Swami was saying, now they have come back because the son has got married and he settled in some other country. He left the mother and father alone in India. Swami said, the whole circle has been completed now. They came crying for a son. Now they are coming crying because of the son. <laughs> so when we come to Swami, we ask for all of these things. And Swami said in that discourse, much of what you ask me can be gained by your own effort. Just like as I said, I'm, I'm not going to pray to Swami if I want to drink a glass of water. Similarly, much of, if you want more money, you can work hard and earn the money. You want a better position in life, there is a way to get it. If you want to achieve anything in life, you want to learn music, you want to build your talent, there is a way by which you can do it yourself. Swami said, why do you come to me for something that you can do by yourself? Isn't it a waste of coming to me for that? He said, ask from me something that only I can give. Can we all think of something like that? Ask of me only what I can give. And then Swami says, the only thing that you cannot get anywhere is love for Swami. So if you really want to ask of me something and make use of, Swami will say, the Kalpa picture, I can give you anything you want. Ask of me what is worth, worthy of being asked from the Lord Himself, that is Swami. Give me love for you. Right? Because that I know is the only way in which I can make best use of you. But is there a practical way of you know, developing this love for Swami? Uh, there was this very interesting question that Dr. Hislop asked Swami once. He said, Swami, isn't it that you either have love or you don't have love? You have devotion, you don't have devotion. Is there any way you can build that? I really don't think so, Swami. And then Dr. Hislop, uh, Swami asked him, Hislop, do you think that you have love for Swami? <coughs> he paused for a couple of seconds and he said, Swami, I believe so. Because I believe that something happens in me when I think of you and I believe that that is love. Swami said, good, yes, you have love for Swami. Where did that love come from? Swami asked him. He said, Swami, I don't know, because it just came, it just, you know, it, it just, there was a spring of devotion for you. I don't think I've done anything in a structured manner to get this love. Swami said, that is true, but that spontaneous burst of love came into your heart because at some point you have done sadhana. So if we suddenly feel that we we have love for Swami, we have devotion for Swami. This is not to not to tell tell ourselves that oh I am a great sadhaka, I have done something. This is to tell ourselves that even now sadhana is important. The sadhana that we do now, be it in the form of bhajans, namasmarana, meditation, all of that leads to that love. Though we may or may not recognize how it happens. The other answer that Swami gave Dr. Hislap was a very beautiful one. He said, you know, Dr. Hislap used to carry this tape recorder with him all the time. Because he used to record these questions and answers and that's how he uh, compiled it in the form of a book, Conversations with Bhagavan Sri Sathya Sai Baba. So Swami looked at the tape recorder and Swami said, you see that tape recorder? For many, many months, it was lying on the shelf of a shop. And then Swami said, there are many times you have walked past that way. You never felt anything about that object. Though you saw it every day, it was there, you were going past it, you had proximity to it. One fine day you went into that shop, you paid some money and you procured that. And Swami said, see now how careful you are about it. 
Swami calls everyone for interview. The first thing you look is where is my tape recorder? You look for it. And then you're all the time careful about it. Oh, somebody should not step on it. I should take care of it. I should, it should be clean. It should be like this. It should be like that. Swami said, where did that emotion come from towards this object? Swami said, because you feel it is my tape recorder. It is mine. The feeling that this is mine is leading you to take care of it, to do things for it. Somebody is going to step on it, you'll put your hand. You don't mind somebody stepping on your hand, but you don't want someone to step on it. And what Swami was telling was very, very profound truth. In Sanskrit, there is a word for love. It's there in Hindi and other languages too. It's called Mamta. Right? Mamata means love. The root of that word is mamatvam, right? Mamatvam becomes mamta or love or affection. The idea of mindness becomes love. So this idea, Swami said, you come to Swami and, he's, and tell him, this is my Swami. Right? That sense of belonging, that this is my Swami, this is not some God. Right? He's not some divinity who is there to bless you. No, look at him and say, I Swami. And the more and more you build this emotion, he's mine. Swami said you feel love. And everything that, that we do is only trying to express this love because love cannot be put in words or put in actions. Everything that we do thereafter is only madness. Right? Be it being a part of the organization, doing this, doing that. Even people like us staying in Prashantanilam. Is, is staying in Prashantanilam or working for the trust equal to loving Swami? No. Which means that will make me loving Swami and all of you not loving Swami. It's not so. But I am just looking for means to express that love. And among the options that were available to me, this was this is one that was appealing to me. And in everyday life, what we have to do is just this. How do I express this love for Swami? How do I express this love for Swami? Coming back to that question of dharma stapana. Right? Every time God comes, dharma is coming down. Swami tells in one of his discourses, there is this fallacy, this is wrong belief that God comes down to protect the pious and punish the wicked. Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chatushkritam. Swami said, do you know that I can never see the bad in people? Imagine, Swami says, I can never see bad in people. I can never see evil in people. I only see good. Because that is what Swami asks us to do. See only the good. Swami said, by nature, I cannot see evil in people. How will I then discriminate? How can I punish the evil? How can I protect the good? The only purpose for which God comes down as an avatar is to kindle love. As someone said, when he comes in a human form, he's more relatable. Right? His love is actually very, very supreme and uh, it takes a lot of time to understand this. Observing him for so long, when he comes and speaks very sweetly and softly to you, it is his love. The day when he does not look at your face, it is his love. The day when you make a prayer and you want him to come and answer, Instantly Swami will come and protect you. Instantly Swami will come there. That is His love. There are sometimes we are praying for years and years and years together and Swami just doesn't respond. That is His love. But we, as I said, have a concept of what is love. So He fits into that concept. He fits into that concept and one day He will look at you and say, ah, when did you come? 
and you would see Swami's face light up. I, I've seen that. Like someone has just flashed a light on Swami when you would see some devotees. Oh, so nice to see you. He would just come and because we, we wanted to feel love in that way. But in this process, slowly he is taking us to the point where we see that everything is his love. The relief that he gives for our pain is love. The pain itself is love. And when we start understanding this, see, because everything else that we seek from him is within this bracket from life to death. Whatever you ask, right? Be it, be it health, be it wealth, be it promotion, everything is between birth to death. But what Swami has come to give is cannot be defined by this timeline. He has come to give us something that is going to last much, much, much more longer. And as Swami says, I give you what you want so that someday, someday we will say, Swami, but what have you come to give? I want all these things, but you came down, you took the initiative to come down. What is it that you wanted to give? There was this uh, story which one of my seniors, again, who was still working in the ashram, he was telling. Swami was talking to a group of students who were, <coughs> I think, undergraduate students and postgraduate students. And Swami suddenly told them, Do you know Tyagaraja, Saint Tyagaraja? He's a great devotee of Rama. I think all of us know that. He had a very fond desire. He wanted to have the darshan of the Navagrahas, right? the nine planets which are supposed to be governing our life. Swami said that Dhyagaraja wanted to have the darshan of the Navagrahas because he had read somewhere, Dhyagaraja had read somewhere that if you are able to earn the grace of Navagrahas, their effect on your mind will be reduced. And then he can express devotion and love to Rama. So he wanted to have the darshan of Navagraha so that he can win their grace and be able to love God. And Swami told this whole thing. And so Swami heard this whole, he told this whole thing and Swami said, Chala Papu. He tried very hard but he could not get the darshan at all. The boys were listening to the story. And suddenly Swami's eyes lit up. Do you want to have the darshan? Imagine the great Tyagaraja could not have the darshan and Swami is asking, do you want to have it? Chustara, do you want to have the darshan of Navagrahas? So he said, yes Swami, why not? <laughs> Tyagaraja has not got it, we are getting it. Right? You can put it on my tombstone. <laughs> so he said, yes Swami, why not? And Swami waved his hand and apparently materialized a a copper plate, right, in which the houses, as we see in a astrological chart, is there, and the different uh, navagrahas and their vahanas were all in, uh, engraved on that. So Swami showed it to all of them, and Swami said, "See how lucky you all are. That darshan that Yagaraja did not get, you are all getting." And Swami showed it around. Then Swami asked. Do you also want the blessings of the Navagrahas? Swami has given the whole details of what happens if you get the blessings of the Navagrahas, isn't it? He said, Swami, that blessing which Tyagaraja craved for and did not get, will we say no to? Then Swami called the students one by one, Swami called, put that plate on their head. And I think Swami might have even chanted something and did this whole thing. And then suddenly Swami started laughing. <laughs> and then Swami said, You fools. That Lord who can create the Navagrahas is in front of you. And here you are, delighting over the fact that we had the darshan of the Navagrahas, <laughs> blessings of the Navagrahas. And see how beautifully Swami played it along, right? <laughs> Because that, that is how small our mind is. 
the blessing that he has come to give is already given. The day he has stepped into our life, the greatest blessing is already given. I often think of this this way. You know? Again, going back to these game shows where you win a million dollars, who wants to be a millionaire and all that, right? If you observe any of the winners, how is the last round like? You, you correctly answer the last question and they write a check and they give it to you. The moment the person receives the check, he starts jumping. Why? Because he's become a millionaire. The money is still in the bank. The money has not come to him. But that sign means that you're a millionaire now. The same has happened to each one of us. The day Swami has stepped into our life, to reaching that goal, whatever it is, I don't know, I don't, I can't define moksha and all that. Whatever is that ultimate goal has already been written on a check and given to you. So what happens when these episodes of Swami coming as Navagraha, see one thing which oftentimes even our own students in the university tell us is uh, all these are stories which happened in the past, it didn't happen to us, we are not the fortunate ones. It's the same Swami. It might not have happened to me, it didn't happen to me. But that Swami is the same Swami, isn't it? So what, what should this recognition of who Swami is do to our life? So when Swami said that the best way to make use of my presence is to love me, much later Swami explained what is this love. Swami asked some of the students, do you know what is love? And then Swami drew a triangle on the, on the air, like in the air. Swami said, love is threefold. Swami says love is selfless, fearless, ceaseless. So do we all have love for Swami? We have spurts of love. Love for Swami should make us fearless. Right? What can this world throw at us that I, I and my Swami cannot deal with? That fearlessness is what defines our recognition of Swami in our life, isn't it? What can happen to this life? Swami is there. Nothing can touch me. Right? Because it is not just that I love Swami. Because my Swami loves me. He cannot allow anything that is going to harm me come into my life. If it happens, it only because it is good for me. That fearlessness, Swami said, is a sign of love. And then Swami said, selflessness. I'm sure all of us have felt selflessness towards somebody or the other, right? Towards a child, towards our parents, towards a wife or husband. That selflessness turns to Swami. As someone said, putting Swami ahead of you, all others next and myself last. Again, it becomes an expression of that same love. And finally, Swami says, ceaselessness, changelessness. Loving today, not loving tomorrow. Swami would uh, very beautifully say, Sankata was there, Venkata Tavana. The moment some problem comes, Swami, 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 tomorrow everything is fine, then you forget Swami. Then how do you ensure that you think of Swami all the time? Gratitude, right? So, as someone said, gratitude. The moment you develop the attitude of gratitude, you will find ways to be happy, to think of Swami even when you are happy. Ah, oh, Swami, such a nice thing happened. Thank you. So that changelessness in this nature of love, there is this very beautiful portion in the Ramayana where the, the duel between Vali and Sukriva is supposed to happen, right? And uh, this is in Ramkatara Swami, Swami writes it this way. So Sukriva is still not sure of Rama. There's this king who has come who is like, uh, in exile. Will he be able to help me? Because Vali is an extremely strong personality, extremely strong. So he says, before I forge a friendship with Rama, 
I will have to test him. Is he really strong enough to uh, defeat Vali? So the test that he gives Rama is, when Vali and Sukriva were younger, they had this contest between them. They would go to a place where there is a row of palm trees and they will shoot an arrow at it and they will see that how many palm trees can one arrow go through. So in that contest, in that contest he says that I got only two trees but Vali got some five trees or something like that. So he takes Rama to a place and he says if you are able to shoot more than five or even as many as five, I will take it that you are strong enough to beat Vali. And even as he's saying this, Sugriva says that you know, these palm trees are much thicker and healthier than the trees that we brought down. So in his mind he thinks that even two of these, two of these trees, if Rama is able to bring down with his arrows, he's really strong. Rama smiles and he shoots an arrow and Swami writes, 11 trees were brought down and those 11 trees were taken and thrown at a huge distance away. The moment Sugriva sees this, he realizes whose presence he was in. He says, this cannot be a human strength. And he falls down at Rama's feet and he says, oh my God, I did not recognize you. You are the Supreme Lord, you are the Supreme Master and all that. And he says, I am not interested in that kingdom anymore. I will serve you. I found the Master. I will serve you. That is more than enough for me. This is enough, Swami. I will serve you. And Rama says, but I have already given you the word, so let us go. Let us fight with Vali. So then what happens, the fight between Vali and Sukriva happens, I think most of you know the story. The first one is a disaster. Rama is not able to recognize which is Vali and Sukriva. And he comes back, all battered up, because Vali has beaten him up black and blue. Sukriva comes back, what does he say? Oh Rama, you are such a cheek. I trusted you and I went for the battle and see what has happened to me. And then he says, had you told me that you are not able to, at least I would have fought. I say he could have. And he says, you cheated me, I trusted you, I went like this. Then Swami writes very profoundly, very beautifully, he writes, Rama tells Sugriva, but Sugriva, I could not see the difference between you and Vali. Means, you are also a monkey. Your mind is also like Vali's only. And then what does he do? He puts a garland around Sugriva and he says, now you go. What does that mean? It is a garland of grace. I think that's precisely what Swami has done to each one of us. Left out into the world, there will be no difference between us and anybody else. That is the case, right? We are all as worldly as anyone can be. But Swami has put a garland on each one of us, a garland of grace, so that at least now behave differently, carry yourself differently. So then Swami goes on to write that after Sugriva comes back fully hurt, it seems Rama just caresses the wounds that Sugriva had and instantly all the wounds get healed. And again Sugriva says, oh my God, Rama, you are the great Lord, you are the Supreme Lord. I don't want the kingdom, I don't want my wife, I will serve you. And then Rama says, Sugriva, relax. He says, this is not devotion. This is only emotion. <laughs> what comes and goes is emotions. Devotion is that which never goes, which never comes. That changelessness, that steadiness of devotion. Right. So right now, do we all have love for Swami? Yes, I would like to believe so. But is it that love that he deserves? I can tell from myself, not yet. That day when we are able to love Swami, the way Swami loved each one of us, that day our love will be perfect. And the best thing that we can do, the only thing, the only worthwhile thing that we probably can do is constantly ask, become restless. I've got a hundred million dollars, what am I going to do? This thought should probably wake us up in the middle of the night. Am I making use of this opportunity that I've got? 
Swami has walked into my life. What am I doing? Everything else will go on, right? We were all students of Swami. We had our career. We had our education. People got married. Family life. Everything goes on. But in the midst of all this, Swami, what am I supposed to do with this blessing? What am I supposed to do with this blessing? And if it is to love you, how do I love you? If I am not able to love you, Swami, give me that love. Give me that love. Give me that love. So we would say that's what the Gopikas did. So we would sing that the beautiful Patyam Prema Raheta Maru Bhumalalu Prema Kuralu Pen Bunda. He says the Gopikas go to Krishna and say, Krishna, we have realized that our hearts are barren. They have no hope. You come, you sow the seeds of love, you nourish them with the waters of love. And you ensure that they all sprout into saplings of love. And Swami has said this. Swami said, if you acknowledge that only Swami can do this, and you come to me and say, Swami, give me love, Swami said, I will. Because that is completely different, right? To to know Swami like that, to love Swami like that. Because this life is extremely small. We are so obsessed with it. But believe Swami when he says that thousands and thousands and thousands of lives we have led. In all those lives we have pursued money. In all those lives we have pursued companionship, family, and wealth and welfare. In the midst of all of this, like a spark, Swami has come. If we continue to use Swami to fill our aspiration, fulfill our aspirations of the world, what a waste it would be. So the one thing that we all have to do is flip this. We should use the world to win Swami. And that's precisely what all of us are doing, isn't it? Whatever we take up, like I'm working in radio side, that is what I'm trying to do. I have to do something. So let me do it in a manner that it is going to take me closer to Swami. I am a doctor, I am a lawyer. You continue to do what you are doing, but do it in a manner that it will take you closer to Swami. You are a mother, you are a father. Continue to dispense that role in a manner that it will take you closer to Swami. And I think I did not complete that Dharma Stapana. Right? So Swami said, I cannot see the difference between evil in a person and bad in a person. So I cannot distinguish and punish one and protect another. Swami said, the only dharma that the Lord comes down in a human form to foster is prema dharma. Every time the Lord comes in a human form, Swami said, it becomes more and more feasible for people to have love for him. If there is anything that God can do only when he comes down in a form and not otherwise is this. To strike this human relationship with each one of us. Which can be eventually transformed into a divine relationship. Right? He has come down only for that prema dharma. And other things happen. The good get fostered. The wicked get punished. Right? When the sun, sun is shining. So many things happen, but the sun doesn't shine for that. Swami said the only reason why an avatar comes down is to fulfill the aspirations of those devotees who have yearned for my presence. And for those who have not had that yearning, to kindle that yearning. Swami has literally done that to each one of us. As Mr. was asking, what has Swami's disappearance done to you? It is like someone who has given you a taste of it. Now we cannot, as I like to say, the world has lost its taste for us. Now in everything we are looking for the same taste. Right? We are looking for that same taste of the Lord's presence. He has made us mad. And thankfully for that, isn't it? So in the midst of all of this, always ask 
you said this, am I making best use of Swami's presence in my life? The answer that you get can be different. It's not the same as what it should be for the person sitting next to you. But become restless. Become, I mean, we become restless for so many things. So many things, including as Brother Diva was saying, a passport doesn't come. We are so worried. Oh, when will my passport come? When will the visa happen? Simple things makes us restless. This is the only thing which is worth being restless about, worried about. So I think that is probably uh, the thought I wanted to leave all of you with. With to whom much is given, Swami would say, much is expected. Swami doesn't expect. Swami has no expectations from us. Swami had told students once, I have no expectations from you fellows. Because Swami will say, when there is appointment, there will be disappointment. I have no appointments, I have no disappointments. So Swami doesn't expect, but that's something we should expect out of ourselves. That having known Swami, our life cannot be the same again. Having found Swami, and when I say life, it is not just this life. Lifetimes to come should be different. Right? So with these thoughts, I'll uh, conclude this one. In, in case any of you have any questions, you can. If there is time. Brother. <laughs> yes. It was one, I think I'll take that. Yeah. When does Swami interfere with karma in a big way? Would prayers help with it? So thus, this is a question we always have. Right? Karma, is it impregnable? Can grace really come and break karma? Swami's one line answer to that is, nothing can come in the way of my grace. Not your karma, not anyone's karma. If you win his grace, there's nothing that can stop it. That is the bottom line truth. But when he chooses to let karma play out, when he chooses to intervene, I don't think any of us have the wisdom to know that. So the, re the best thing to do is, there is always, we always have a desire for a certain outcome, right? If I am unwell, my desire is I should become well. If I write an exam, my desire is I should clear the exam. So we always have a desire for outcome until we reach the final state when we become absolutely desireless. As Swami said, one of the uh, qualities of love is selfless and desirelessness. Till we reach that state, we will be having desires. So the only right thing to do is, Swami, this is what I want, but you know best. That is the only sensible thing we can do. And Swami will change things in ways we cannot change because we always have to keep that in the mind. There is nothing. I mean, uh, Swami will not not do something because he is not able to that we can be absolutely sure of. There was this student of Swami who, was, uh, who had finished his exam, his master's, I'm sorry, his bachelor's. So in those days, there was no master's in Swami's college. So you had to go to a college in Anantapur and do there. So some of these boys who had finished their graduation were sitting in the mandir and Swami had come to them and Swami said, okay, what are you all doing? You go back, join your father's business. You go and take up a job. Some of the boys were saying, Swami, we would like to stay back and serve. And Swami said, no, 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 there's no place. All that drama used to happen. So Swami comes to this boy and this boy says, Swami, I would like to continue my studies. If it is possible for Swami, if Swami can get a seat for me in Anantapur, that uh, government college, I will stay in Parthi and attend the college there or something like that, he told me. Till then, Swami was talking to everyone. The moment the boy made the statement, Swami turned to him very sharply. So he said, what did you say? He said, Swami, seat in the college. 
What did you say before that? He said, Swami, if it is possible for you. <laughs> right? In Telugu, Swami, Miku, we like if it is possible for Swami. He said, what do you mean by that? Swami said, see, if that is the faith that you have, then you don't deserve grace. Swami said, I will not, I, I can get you a seat, but I will not get you the seat. That faith should, in every every thought, every word it should express. Right? He very casually, very politely he said, Swami, if it is possible for you. So even in that word, Swami doesn't like you to express doubt and so on. So when you are in a trouble, will Swami come and please? Yes, definitely he can. He most certainly can. But the more and more we develop the maturity to accept that Swami, what you choose, I accept. As I said in the morning, we don't realize that we are all the time praying only for peace. Right? We are not praying for anything else, we are only praying for peace. The more we understand that, in this thought itself you get peace. Swami, you take care of it. If you, it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it's your will. You already have got that peace. And when it happens, you are again happy. When it doesn't happen, you say, okay. It's all nice to talk about. <laughs> Each one will have to learn in their own difficult way. Right? Yes, something else. Yes, brother. Coming and mm. rather than right. you know, things becoming better. So, yeah, so Swami said, The only dharma that I come to foster is prema dharma. Oh, so that was right? And then Swami actually went on to say, Let's see, I came down as Rama. How many devotees you see in the Kali Yuga who became saints only because of their devotion to Rama? He came down as Krishna. So many more people attained that ultimate state worshipping Krishna. Then Swami said, I have come as Sai, you will see how many more people benefit out of devotion to this form. We all are seeing it, right? I mean, all of these other avatars were all, as we call it, local avatars. Right? Rama was confined to his kingdom, of course, because of his travel, the subcontinent benefited. Krishna was again still confined to the subcontinent during his life. But we've seen Swami's avatar. It's, it's a it's a worldwide phenomenon, isn't it? And we can only think of the world. We don't know what benefit the other worlds have had. So that presence in a human form has a huge impact. And I'm not saying that it's only the physical presence. It is the name and the form. Right? That's why I keep saying name form. Because even when the physical presence was there, for people like all of you in Singapore, it was only name and form. Physical form was there in Parthi, safe. Right? But when you're closing your eye and thinking of that form, when you're taking that name, you connect. So the Lord who is by definition beyond name and form, comes down with a name and form. And then when you slowly start understanding, hey, you cannot define him with this name and form. He must be more than that. Then the next step, what you will say, Okay, all names, all divine names are His. Whether you call Him Jesus, you call Him Allah, you call Him Zorashtra. That understanding comes, okay, all divine names are His. Then slowly will come the understanding. Why only divine names? Every name is His. Why only divine forms? Every form is His. And when that state comes, you'll suddenly it'll occur to you that that Lord who came down in a form and made us mad for him, made us run after him, crave for him. He is in me all the time. Right? I am him. When I remove this name and form of praying and this body, what is left is him. Right? That that will come. And that's why I said that check has already been written. For each one of us it has been written. We will we will all reach that state. But if we are conscious that this is what it is, 
right? We can enjoy it right now too. Right? That's what happens. The moment someone writes a check for us, we are happy right now. We don't say, okay, when I go to the bank and see the money, then I'll jump up in joy. The person jumps up in joy at that moment the check is written. So similarly, that confidence we should experience now, that excitement, of course, you cannot be dancing on the street and going around. <laughs> but Swami said, you know, people will come and ask you, what is the secret of your happiness? How is it that you're happy all the time? And I see that you have problems. Swami said that that way they will know that you have something which they don't have and they will ask for it. And they will find Swami. That is the only way we can spread Swami's name. Not in any other way. Not by WhatsApp groups, not by social media posts. Only by we being not an example, we being an expression of what it is to know Swami. So shall we conclude then? I offer thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you.